Hello and welcome to the Homesteading Academy, where homesteaders come to learn. Tonight, we have an episode of Calving 101, and we have a very special guest with us this evening, which is Glenn from the Cow Emporium. They have a channel and they have a farm in Canada, and I would like to bring him up and so give a warm welcome to Glenn. Hello, Glenn. Welcome. Hi, Lisa. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be here. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. It's great to have you here. Um, so. I was just going to, yeah, you were probably going to ask me, I'm sorry, about um, our background and stuff and, and what we do here. Uh, we're a farm in southern Alberta, Canada, and uh, we're a mixed farm with, with grain and cattle. And uh, we, it's a family farm. It's been in the family since 1904. So I was like born here and raised here and we've had cattle ever since the beginning. And I've been, you know, helping out in the barn since I was old enough to go and probably, you know, pulled my first calf when I was 14 or so. And, and I'm older than that now. So, so we've, we've done a lot of it, but you know, I'm not a vet and um, conditions are, are different in different places. So I can only really speak to what I know and my experiences here. And I'd just be happy to share with you, you know, what my experiences have been and, and let you know a little about, you know, that kind of stuff. We'd love to, we'd love to. Um, if for anyone who has not seen Glenn and Annette's channel, which is the Cow Emporium, I do have a link in the description box down below. I will also have it pinned in the chat. Uh, they go through a very lengthy calving season and every year, and I always look forward to it. I'm sure they look forward to it, but at the same time, are probably exhausted just thinking about it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, we, uh, well, gestation is roughly 286 days, but that is, that's breed dependent. Like if you have black Angus, for example, you can expect some calves earlier than that. Um, we usually put our bulls out about May 15th. So that puts our, you know, our, our first calf date. Oh, about February 23rd, but you know, that can vary depending on the year and the breed and all the rest of it and uh, so we're calving our our weather conditions are really variable so we're calving in some really extreme cold weather and then we can have a chinook roll in and we'll be you know calving it'll be like um beautiful like room temperature i guess in the states is 71 degrees sort of sort of day and uh but we could get down to uh well certainly minus 30 Celsius, which is, I don't know, minus 25 Fahrenheit is uh, some of our cold nights too. So um, presents some different challenges. And it's like the, the fellow that has a, a foot in a freezing bucket of water and the other foot in a boiling bucket of water, you can say on the average we're comfortable. And that's kind of what calving is like here. That's a good comparison. <laughs> So I guess I uh, was just going to talk about uh, basic calving for people that are just getting into like cows and stuff and, and what I would sort of recommend. Um, uh, first, calf heifers are, you know, always going to be a challenge for you. If you're going to have trouble, you're going to have trouble with them and they're going to be flighty. So it's nicer for first timers to have a cow that's already had a couple of calves and has a pretty good track record and you have some idea of what she's like. Um, we're, in, we're into beef cattle, we're not into dairy, so um, I can't really speak too much as to, to dairy cows, but I know that um, we don't generally have trouble with uh, mastitis or too much with the, with the beef cattle because we're, we're not into milking as much as, as the dairy people. But uh, so having having said that, um, like a good healthy calf is usually the result of having a, a healthy cow with a healthy pregnancy and providing you know everything we need for that from food and water and, and hygiene and all the rest of it. So if you can keep your vitamins and minerals up and uh, 
keep her a little bit exercised. Um, if they're just laying around in the corral and not, you know, getting up and moving too much, they need to be in shape because it's, uh, it's a lot of work to have a calf and you need to be in shape for it. So a little bit of walking around is good. Um, so if you've got a cow that's calving a couple of weeks before your due date, you should uh, make sure that you're, you've got a calving pen set up someplace in case you uh, need to do some work on her. And uh, I would strongly recommend building, like if you have something you can do like inside is definitely best or certainly sheltered. And uh, uh, calving pen, if you're building it, uh, 10 by 10 is probably a minimum size. 12 by 12 is better. Ours is uh, 10 by 12. And you should uh, make it out of like solid boards and uh, solid posts in the ground. And if you can get a, a self-catch head gate, put it in one corner and uh, mm -hmm. put it in so that it kind of chases them into the self-catch head gate. And Great idea. Reason, the reason for having a really hard calving area, like a good solid shark tank, I like to call it, is you, know, you never know what's going to happen during calving. And if you're going to go with panels, you need to have your panels tied onto something solid. And if your shark tank is solid, then you can build your temporary stuff around that. But mm -hmm. your actual calving pen needs to be solid. Mm -hmm. um, we used to, before we had a self catch head gate, we used to rope them in the barn and that was always quite the rodeo. <laughs> Tie them off to a post and and do that. But the self catch head gate's better because once they're in there and you got it set right, then you know you if you need to go to work on them, you've got a place you can do that. And uh, and if you're you know having to work with the calf and stuff later and it's just just a good place to put them ahead of time if once you see them starting to calve you can put them in there and get things out of the weather and sorry go ahead i i know there's a delay so i was trying to just give you a signal so that way we don't overlap because i'll do that okay. but i'm really glad that you're going over the structure and the importance of it because Obviously, I don't have cows. I don't have that experience, but we did farrow this year and we did set up our farrowing area. And as soon as the first pig farrowed, we thought we had the greatest setup, right? But as soon as she farrowed, we realized where we could make improvements right away. So I, I really am glad that you're emphasizing the importance of something being strong, durable, and, you know, set up really good because that helps to set you up for safety, uh, yes. safety of your animals, safety of yourself and all that. Right. Yes. I mean, it, it it's, you can do it, um, you know, with, with a rope and all the rest of it, but if you've never done it before, you, you need to, you know, have everything swinging like it should and shutting like it should and solid because, their temperament can change so dramatically when they have, you know, have a calf and uh, safety is, you know, super important. So, um, yeah, so, so once you get yourself, you want to have things kind of set up and be kind of prepared ahead of time. A few things you might want to have gathered or, you know, you'll need, we use a uh, betadine, which is like a surgical soap, a bucket of hot water, some obstetrical chains, uh, uh, pulling handles. Um, it's it's good to have a rope just in case, but it also um, more important maybe even than a rope is to have some kind of hook with like a four or five foot handle on it so that if you do manage to get something roped, you can get the rope off of, off of it. Because <laughs> you can get them roped and then go, okay, that's good. Now, how do I get the rope off? <laughs> <laughs> good point. So, you know, all, the, all these things are just stuff that you hope you don't have to use, but you have it, you have it there and, and ready to go. And uh, it's not all that expensive to have that stuff on hand. And if you do need it, you won't have time to go gather it later. And you just want to be well prepared. Um, there are uh, big pullers that are available. And if you haven't got a lot of experience, maybe it's better if you know somebody that has some, or, you know, if you, you get to that point, maybe get a vet out. 
um, if you're having to do an assistance, but you know, I'll kind of talk to, about that a little bit later as far as gathering that up. So um, you get close to your calving date, um, you should start checking, um, you know, keep an eye on them for, to see if they're, they're starting to, the udder's starting to, to, you know, fill with milk and um, you'll see them start to get quite a bit bigger around the midsection. And sometimes there's a little bit of mucusy discharge, like three days before the calf from, from her back end and kind of watch for that. Um, but they can surprise you. So <laughs> you can go out and check them and an hour later, there's a calf on the ground, you know, <laughs> especially these old cows. So, I mean, that's ideal. I mean, that's what you want to have happen is go out there and you, you know, oh, I just checked it two hours ago and there's a calf up sucking and that's just, don't feel bad. <laughs> just go, that's a win. <laughs> you don't have to do anything. So, so, um, once you get closer to calving, like um, ideally uh, when you think you're going to be calving, you should be checking every four hours. And uh, what, you're, what you're looking for is a water bag or, you know, if the cow is, if you haven't seen a water bag, but she's jittery or off or isn't eating her feet or, you know, has her tail up or swishy tailed or something. Um, you know something's up, but you don't really start the clock until you see the water bag, and then, and then, uh, then you want to start the clock. So uh, you see the water bag. Uh, you wait about. Oh, you want to check on them at least uh, two hours later, but you know you can check on her an hour later. But be sneaky because if she knows that you're looking at her, she might just stop trying. And uh, also, it's a good time to not have a bunch of company around and to have the dog locked in the house and all the rest of it, because you want her just to, you know, be doing her own thing. And if you have a calving space set up that you want to use and it's convenient, that's a pretty good time to try and, and, and put her into it. So you've only got one to deal with. She's got a nice, you know, bedded area. Put her in the barn. And if she's flighty and you have another older cow um, as a companion animal, um, put that in the barn too, maybe in a separate pen, not together, because uh, an animal by itself just can be really nervous, especially calving. So in cold weather, sometimes we'll load the barn up with four or five cows that aren't calving just for, for body heat in the barn. And that helps keep things warmer in there. And it settles down a younger, flightier cow that's, you know, kind of freaked out a bit. So, wow. so it's it's just a thing. It it works. And so if you can if you can get them into your calving area, you know, that's a good thing. If you want to let them calve out where they are, I mean, that's okay too. But you you know you you have to keep an eye on it. And realize that if there's if something needs to be done, you're either going to have to get her in or 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 not you know, and, and deal mm -hmm. with the field. Um, if they're just calving out in the field and you want to do it out in the field, uh, that's okay too. Um, if usually there's kind of a window, like you're doing your four hour checks, there's kind of a window that after they've been calving for about three hours, they're sort of tired and they're more compliant going in. If you try and chase them in too soon, you might just go round and round in circles. And if you wait too long, they might not have enough strength to walk in on their own steam. Mm -hmm. So kind of three hours is sort of a sweet spot there. So if you're going to bring them in, you know, that three hour point is a, is a good time. And um, certainly before dark, you know, things like that. So you can, if you're just doing one or two or whatever cows um, in, in the barn is a good thing. <laughs> mm -hmm on and, and if you do have trouble it's just super simple so you know try and try and do that if you know that's your first option anyways um so, <laughs> so you, you got your four hour window there after you see the water bag so what you're looking for um you want to see uh one foot the water bag breaks and you want to see one foot then you want to see two feet and it's coming head first, so you want to see the knuckles. 
coming out like this. That means it's coming forward. So if you see, you know, two knuckles and in the nose and you want to see everything progressing and uh, you basically got four hours and you want to see progression being made or then you need to start thinking about intervening by pulling it or getting some help after four hours. Um, by the six hour point, uh, the placenta starts to separate and things start going south from there. So that's, you know, four hours, everything's still healthy and you've got time, but that's why four hours. Cause if you, uh, if you go out, you, it's been six hours since you checked and something started calving, you know, right after you checked, then, then you have a lot more trouble than you need. <laughs> So ideally, you've got, uh, you know, the nose, two feet, and then the calf will come out and hit the ground and, and uh, be shaking its head and everything should be good. And if that's the case, just don't intervene. Don't have a bunch of people in the barn. Just, you know, go away and, and kind of sneak a peek every once in a while to see what's going on. Um, one thing you can run into with an easy, healthy birth, um, run into this quite a bit with Black Angus, is the water bag is uh, particularly strong. And if it's over the face, when they hit the ground, if the cow doesn't get up and lick it off right away, they will suffocate. So that's just one thing if you're around and you see it, a water bag over the nose or the mouth, if there's an opportunity to to just remove that or poke a hole in it or something that you should do that because it just it might save you some grief down the road. Most of the time it's just fine, but you know, it's just, if you see it and you got a chance, you should do something about it. So, um, yeah. So if times when you should intervene, um, uh, okay. So, uh, different things that can happen is, um, Sometimes you'll just see uh, one foot coming out the right way and she's not making a lot of progress. And sometimes the other one is not back quite as far. And that's pretty common to start with. And that's a pretty easy fix because if you like, you get them locked in the head gate and you, you put the chains on and sometimes one, they're, they're just not like, their feet need to both be forward like this, and you just need to straighten out an elbow. And that's a pretty easy fix. You can you can usually pull on that and straighten out an elbow and then, you know, assist her, and then everything, you know, kind of flows through after that or should. And that's, that's pretty common just to have an elbow that needs straightened out. And so when you're pulling, um, one, I'm just an average size guy and like, I could pull as hard as I, I physically could probably, and I, I probably couldn't hurt a cow just by my own strength. Um, two full-grown adults, like men or, or strong, you know, people, whatever, if they're pulling on it, you know, as hard as they could, that you, I, you're kind of getting into the territory where you, where you could hurt, but, you know, if you're pulling that hard, it's probably almost necessary. And if you're using the, the big pullers, you just have, unless you've got some experience, you don't know how much force you're actually putting on the calf. And without a little bit of experience there, you can, you can hurt something pretty bad. So, so one person by themselves. Oh. I just wanted to interject for a minute because I mean, especially for a newbie, that's gotta be pretty intimidating um, to have to assist. And I was thinking, um, I'm glad that you brought up the topic of there's a possibility of hurting the animal, you know, unintentionally. Mm -hmm. um, and when you say hurting, are you talking about like tearing the uterus as a part of that or? Uh, okay. So if, if you've got a condition uh, where, where there's a foot back, like sometimes there's only one foot coming out and the other one hasn't cleared the opening. Uh, you need mm -hmm. to, you'll have to, that's a little bit more complicated. You can still do it. You, you grab the calf's nose and push it back. And then you, you grab the cup, the foot with your hand and bring it up to the opening and then, and then proceed as normal to pull it. But you need to cup it because you don't want to tear anything on the inside there. Mm -hmm. um, 
pulling the calf, um, as you can imagine, it's um, it's hard on the calf and it's a little bit hard on the, the cow too, especially with the big pullers. So um, yeah. if you're to the point where, where two grown men uh, can't get the head out, um, then uh, you need to get a C-section or something. Probably that would be mm. my, you know, unless you've had a lot of experience with the pullers, you're, you're in that, you're in that territory where um, as long as the head hasn't come out yet, you can still do a C-section, you know, if you've got time to get it to the vet or whatever. Um, once, once the head's out and stuff, then um, the odds aren't good for the calf. You can still, you know, save the cow, but the odds are for the calf, if you can't get it out or, not good but uh for for a newbie like just straightening out a foot that's pretty straightforward or a foot back i mean that's that's not not too difficult to deal um if you just got basically size then it's just a sheer you know thing you know strength and technique sort of thing and like i say if, if two grown men can't get the head out then then you need the bet probably for that um gotcha or somebody with the pullers. The whole trick is to know when to stop, you know, and to not be afraid to, if you think, you know what, this is, this is something I don't think I can tackle. Then you're, you're right. Just say, you know what, we got to get the vet out and the vet will do it. And, and you'll be glad you did because you, you can get in over your head awful quick and, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, and so, you know, it doesn't always work out with the vet, but, it, you know, you've got, you know, hundreds of, you know, calves experience behind there and, and they've got access to stuff that you don't to help you out there. And yeah, it's, it's good to be on good terms with your vet. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, something that is probably beyond what most people would want to tackle is a backwards calf. And that's a tricky one. If you see the feet coming and they are the wrong way around and you go in, as soon as you see that, that's an emergency. You need to deal with that. Either that or if you think you want to try and pull it, you got to do that because um, you can verify that if you run her in and you reach in and instead of a nose, there's a tail and you know you got a problem. And what happens with a backwards pull is as soon as the back hips um, come out of the cow, the umbilical cord breaks. So the calf's head is in the cow and it has to breathe. So you need to get it out as soon as possible. And if you get tangled up for any period of time at all, the calf will not make it or, you know, be lungs full of fluid and it's, it's bad. So once those hips come out, it's that's what the big pullers are nice because you can, you know, once the hips pop out, then you can pop that calf out just as quick as you can. And that gives you your best chance. Mm -hmm. um, the odd one is born alive. If an older cow will do it and she'll just pop it out quick and it's fine. But uh, probably one in 50 is backwards in my experience. So, I mean, it happens. And then if you have twins, very often one of them's maybe the second one, I think will be backwards. It's just something that happens and um, it, they can be okay on their own, but uh, yeah, it's, it's an emergency if you see that. Good to know. Um, the other thing you can run into, and this is the toughest one to catch, is um, if you miss a water bag and the cow is, is trying, but there is nothing showing. And that is, that's the kind of the worst case scenario because it's so, you got to be right on the bit to catch that. And if you see the cow trying and nothing going on and maybe a little mucusy at the back end or, or wet or something, you can, you'll have to do an examination to see what's going on. But um, sometimes there'll be something like, it'll be coming forward and there'll be two feet back or um, it can be breach and um if you don't know what breach is the difference between breach and backwards is um backwards is just backwards but the feet are coming out but breach is it's backwards but it's pushing the bum and both front feet are forward and that's a 
that is, you know, a vet can straighten that out if you catch it soon enough and, and fix that. But um, when the cow is pushing, you're, you're trying to fight against the cow and she's pushing and you're pushing the other way. <laughs> it's, it's a call to that situation sort of thing. But wow. These are all, these are all, you know, worst, worst case scenarios, sort of, if you're, you know, pulling a cow or, or a calf, it, you run into it, but um, probably most of the time things, things go pretty well, but you know, the thing is to, to know your four hour, you know, that four hour window, if something doesn't happen or you see something wrong in that four hours to, to start, you know, looking into it and doing something about it, whether it's two o'clock in the morning or, you know, whether you're supposed to be going to work, <laughs> you know, it's gotta be, it's gotta be dealt with. So, <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so most of the time things go well. Um, one of the things you can do with uh, cows is birth weight is very heritable. So if you have a bull that was born with a high birth weight, chances are it'll throw calves with a high birth weight. And that doesn't usually make for easy calving. You, you, you're better off to go with a moderate or a lighter birth weight, especially with heifers. Because uh, with heifers, even with a light birth weight bull, my experience has been you're going to pull 20% of them. And if you have a high birth weight bull with a heifer, you expect to pull 80% of them. And if it's a high birth weight bull, you might be doing two C sector, you know, you might get as many as uh, 20, 10 to 20%. Um, wow. C -cells. So birth weight is so important. And that's why heifers are not really <laughs> great for beginners. They're flighty too. You know, you, you have more trouble with them, but um I'm just speaking from my own experience. I'm sure there's mm -hmm. people that have had, you know, we raise uh, Charley, Black Angus, uh, Red Angus, and Hereford are the, the breeds that we've had experience with. Um, we used to raise Herefords, and they went to a heavy birth weight Charleys, and that was when I was a young teenager and a, you know, just learning about cows and we spent a lot of two o'clock in the mornings at the vet clinic getting c-sections done just until our cow herd got large you know the body frame got big enough to handle the bigger calves so wow um, yeah so let's just assume that now that we've got through all the scary stuff you <laughs> you got a beautiful we made calf. it we made it we went out the barn nothing happened there's a beautiful little calf on the ground and you know, you like to see them shaking their head and looking around and, you know, everything, you know, alert. And sometimes they lay flat out for a little while, but, you know, after a bit, the mom will probably, hopefully she'll stand up and start licking it and just go away. <laughs> Leave them alone. Peek in. Don't let them see you. And uh, then you start the clock again. From the time the calf hits the ground, the most important thing is colostrum, and that's the first milk. Um, so most books say that you want to have the calf get up and get its first milk to get all its antibodies into the system, um, by four hours. Um, you can stretch that a little bit because sometimes they're just not quite ready at four hours, but you know, they're up and sucking by five and it can save you a, a lot of work, but if they're not at four hours, you want to want to be ready you know, to, to feed them. Um, so you should have a bag or two of powdered colostrum, you know, sitting around just in case you need it. Mm -hmm. Um, the, uh, the calf should get up. Sometimes they're up in an hour. Sometimes they're up in half an hour. Sometimes, you know, it's like I say, it's a little slower, but, um, if the calf isn't up, you know, in four and a half, five, six hours, definitely it's time to give it a shot of colostrum. And, uh, yeah, so we, uh, you can run the cow in and milk her if you're feeling really ambitious or if it's three o'clock in the morning and you got to work tomorrow, then mix up the powdered stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, some people have really good luck with the bottles. Um, I haven't had a whole lot of luck bottle feeding 
decaf. They just don't like the powdered stuff and don't like the bottles. So I have, uh, I tube feed quite a bit. And it's just a solid tube feeder with a tube. And you can probably Google how to use one of these properly more than I can tell you about it. Um, it's, uh, you got to do it. You got to put the tube in there. It's got a little ball on the end that uh, kind of helps keep it from going into the lungs. So it should go down. It should bypass the lungs and get it in the stomach. You want to have it all the way in. You want your milk to be, you know, just like basically so that you can't feel it on your when you're touching it. You don't want it too hot or too cold. Mm -hmm. And uh, make sure it's all the way in the stomach. And then you, you start feeding it and you feed it. And then when the bottle's empty, you pull the tube out. And and then you're you're good for you know, 12 hours once the calf has some colostrum. It gives it some time if it's a little bit weak to get on its pins and to find its mom and uh, if it's three o'clock in the morning and it's time then you know you can do that and then deal with it you know at a, at a reasonable hour um, mm -hmm. so the colostrum is is super important to the entire life of the calf it, it, if it doesn't get colostrum it'll just kind of never really be what it could be its entire life so whether oh. it gets it from its mother or from you know powdered stuff it, it's got to be on board that's just you do that yeah that's fascinating that whether it's the mom or the powdered replacement colostrum it's still that crucial you know i think because we're so it's ingrained in us to say okay it's got to be from the mom right yeah but it's really cool that the powdered replacement can serve that purpose if needed yeah, it's like obviously the mother's milk is going to be the best option, but if it's three o'clock in the morning and you, you know, <laughs> you've been pulling, you know, like for us, our busy time, we might have 15 calves in a day. And if it's 30 below, you're busy. So at three o'clock in the tired. morning, you're like, get the colostrum into it, get it in the shed and bought out and, you know, you know, we just, and get on to the next one because, but, um, so yeah, and uh, yeah. So then you want to you want to keep an eye on it, make sure it gets up and gets sucking and stuff. Um, we, uh, if you've got to work with the calf, um, you want to separate it from the cow, because uh, even a friendly cow, when you're dealing with the calf, can they're they got all that those hormones going and they can turn into a, a real tiger. So um, you want your shark cage working <laughs> good. Usually mm -hmm. uh, we can, you can get the calf and usually there's some space between the gate and the, the floor and you can, we have a calf hook so you can kind of pull them, the, you know, underneath the gate without the cow getting in and stuff them back in together when you're done. You know, if she, you want to give them some time to bond when they're first born, if she's, like having trouble getting up on her pins, maybe you want to just have her the calf so she can't fall on it. Whether that means moving it out of the you know out of the pen so she can see it or or something, and then putting them back in together so that she can move around. Like she won't step on it knowingly, likely. Um, but if it's buried in a bunch of deep straw, or if she's spooked, or she's just clumsy because her back end is weak then something bad might happen but uh yeah so uh for us like calving temperature is super important because um you know we get some awful ugly you know, cold weather here so um basically what did i write down um yeah for calving outside, out in the open, if there's no wind, we kind of go with, uh, if it's any colder than uh, minus 15 Celsius or plus 5 Fahrenheit, that's kind of the maximum temperature. You, you know, if, she, if the cow licks it off right away and, and um, you know, it'll, it'll probably be okay out there if it's got some good bedding and can get out of the wind. Um, 
but you, you know, you might risk losing some ears. Some people put duct tape around the ears or they, they actually make toques that you can put on calves to keep the ears wow. from losing. Um, but any colder than minus 15, it's, it's nice to have them, you know, in some shelter. Um, and, uh, yeah. And it's, that's gotta be dry too. Um, it can be a lot warmer than that. And, and if they have it in a mud puddle, your calf can you know, go back. It's really quick too. So mm -hmm. you need to keep a real close eye on stuff. If it's colder than that and, you know, put it in the barn for, for cold weather calving and, and stuff. So I don't Lots know. of prayers for good weather every year, huh? That makes or breaks our calving season. You know, if we have a, a cold snap in March, it, it's just crazy. Yeah. But we find that we actually, because we're checking every two hours or sooner when it, it gets cold, especially like it can be, it has got down to minus 35 Celsius, which is minus 31 Fahrenheit when we've been calving. And that's awful. You know, we're checking every hour, and if a calf hits the ground, even in the barn, we, we everything goes into the shed under the heat, and we got to dry everything off. And then, you know, probably if we don't have, we got to get colostrum into them, and then hopefully it warms up during the day. But mm -hmm. in, in that kind of cold temperature, then you can wind up with some really, you know, even a dry calf, you can, you can wind up with some frozen body parts, and it's not not cool mm. so, yeah if you don't have heated calving conditions try and calve when it's warmer than that <laughs> those are those are extreme temperatures but um we can get a chinook too and then then it's basically you don't have much trouble but uh, yeah it's weather weather can play a big part in it yeah <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's my my basically my my big spiel. Is there you know? Do you have any questions or? You know? I think you gave very detailed information for folks, and I I always loved it, well, especially on your channel. I love that you're very straightforward about how things are because there is a reality to this, and I think sometimes newbies have the reality in their head that it's going to be beautiful but it's not always that way. It no. can still be beautiful, but it's there are complications that come up and identifying which is an emergency that requires the vet or you know requires immediate action and knowing when you're over your head is very important. Yeah. for people to know. Yeah, for sure. Um, having a good you know, having a good conversation with your, your vet and a good relationship with them, it's, you know, and, and finding a good vet clinic is, is priceless. Like mm -hmm. um, whatever they say, we just take it as, you know, they, they know we'll do it. <laughs> so. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Would you recommend for somebody who now, you, well, let me back up for a minute. You're calving on a very large scale. How, how large is your herd or how large are the, the, how many cows are you having calve every season? Yeah, it roughly? varies with the drought, but we've been as high as like 150 and we're, we're down to about 120 now you know, in that ballpark. Okay. So for somebody who, um, you know, is out there and only has say a family cow, Sure. Right. Or they've just bred and they only have one. Would you recommend that they reach out to, I'm sure they would have, but reach out to their vet ahead of time to give them a heads up that they think the cow is going to be calving and whatever. Yeah. It's certainly, you know, you go to your vet clinic and, you know, uh, most vet clinics are, are good with advice and to, you know, Sometimes you can buy supplies cheaper other places, but on the other hand, supporting your vet clinic, there's a certain amount of, you know, <laughs> if you buy stuff from them, they're more likely to answer the phone when you call. <laughs> mm -hmm. It might cost mm -hmm. you a little more for something, but then on the other hand, when it's, you know, Easter Sunday and you're having trouble, they'll show up <laughs> sort of thing. Um, but yeah, that's uh 
that's a good thing. Uh, for for a person with a family cow, like um, like finding finding a bull for it is is usually the challenge, and and uh, you know asking you know questions about birth weight and knowing a little bit about the pedigree of the bull before you start and the breed and, and having a conversation with your vet about about what they think would be good to to put with the cow and and stuff um, and temperament like you can have the best cow in the world and if she's you know things things can change in a big hurry <laughs> when you're calving and, and having some history she's if she's been on a, a neighbor's farm and had you know four years easy calving good calves and and whatnot and they're they're willing to you know use the same bull sort of thing then that's that's a good place to start um a bad place to start would be maybe to go to an auction market and buy a single a bred cow that you had no history on or a heifer because the big guys usually or guys I'm, I'm not that big compared to guys around us but singles or small lots when they go through the auction market there's usually a reason why they're selling them they don't you know if you have a neighbor that's you know getting rid of you know downsizing a herd or something for for a reason that you're aware of other than you know getting rid of problem cows and that's it's a good place to start you just go yeah that's a great point because I think, and that, you know, I'm naive in many areas, so I'm not trying to sound like an expert at all, but I do know that at least with hogs, right, there's that I'm going to keep the good mothers because sure. obviously that makes sense, right? Because you want to just keep those bloodlines going of the mothers that are just easy peasy and things are yeah. going well. I don't know if it works the same with cows, but that was one thing that, I was told to look out for is if somebody had an older pig um, that had already farrowed, you might want to find out why it is being removed from the herd because chances are it may have savaged the piglets at birth. It may have um, been a horrible mother and created 13 bottle piglets, um, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm really glad that you're bringing this up because a lot of people go to auctions and think, that's a great idea. But a lot of the times that's the way people get rid of the problem. Yeah. Um, you know, there is, there is money to be made if you don't value your, your time by, by buying singles, because they're generally going to be a lot more work somewhere down the line. Um, either knowing who you're buying from somebody reputable or like knowing the history of the animal or, Possibly like if it's a herd dispersal where they're getting rid of a bunch of them, then you have a little bit um, more of an inkling of what the motivation is rather than, you know, having it be a problem animal or, or something genetically that they didn't want, you know. So, and yeah, singles are notorious, can be notoriously bad for that. So, <laughs> You know, and that's good to know because that you know someone who's looking for a family cow or a very small breeding program, so to speak, uh, on a homestead might be the the victim of something like that because they think oh, I'm getting such a good deal. Yeah, and yeah, it's it's nice to like if you have a like a community of people, if you can develop that around yourself of people you know and trust and who have cows and. I mean, you can you can go to the greatest person in the world, and he'll think he, they're selling you a great cow, and you can still have trouble with it just because cows they'll make a liar out of you quicker than anything. He said, "Oh yeah, she's a good one," <laughs> and then you get it home, and it, it may or may not be, but you know, you you got a better chance that way. You know, dealing with somebody that you know, and and there's like if you if you know somebody like being as as the breeding can usually that's usually the hang up is because having bulls around is expensive and difficult and you know ai is is complicated so you know if there's a few of you together maybe you can you know arrange something between you know a few of you to to make that work um, that being said um biosecurity is, is still really important you know at calving time we try and 
stay out of the auction markets. And if you, you know, go to visit a neighbor, you disinfect your boots when you come home or burn them, or, you know, you, you want to maintain biosecurity as, as best as possible. Because um, one thing some people will do is they'll, if they have, you know, a set of twins or maybe a calf will lose its mother, they, or they'll go to an auction market and, and buy an old milk cow, or maybe they'll have a cow that's lost a calf and they'll go to the auction market and buy a, a young calf to put on it. And that can be a, a real recipe for heartache because, you know, that the young calf has been stressed and then it doesn't have a good immune system. And then it's run through, you know, an auction market. They, they do their best to keep them clean, but everything in the world has gone through there. And then, you bring that home and you, that's a recipe for heartache. So mm -hmm. it, it can work out for you, but you know, there's certainly, you know, you're taking a pretty big risk too by doing it. So. I'm glad you brought up biosecurity because I recently saw something and, and I thought I was pretty good about things, but I have a lot to learn. Um, but I saw somebody uh, in North Carolina actually turn around and say part of their, biosecurity protocol, as you mentioned, is the boots. And they say that they have a pair of boots that, that they're the only ones they wear on the farm. They go nowhere else with it. Yeah. Um, and they do that on a, a full-time basis, mm -hmm. not just calving season. So I, I found that interesting. And I think that's a really great tip to just make sure you're not dragging stuff in. Yeah, for sure. When the vet comes to your place, the last thing he does is he takes and he scrubs his boots down with a brush and some betadine scrub and changes his clothes before he gets in and goes to the next place. So that's just, that's just what they do. And, you know, that's certainly if you're, you know, helping a neighbor, <laughs> you know, you want to make mm -hmm. sure that you're not bringing something home by accident too. So you know, clean clothes and, you know, certainly disinfect your boots or just have a pair of boots that doesn't go anywhere except where you're you know, at home too. Great points. Great points. Well, Glenn, I just want to thank you so much for, for coming in today and sharing all this information. I learned a lot of stuff today. Yeah. I hope I did. I'm really glad. I talking and I just go on. <laughs> No, you did wonderful. And I really enjoyed it. And it's really going to give our viewers um, a lot of information on things, because I think things like being prepared with supplies, having a relationship with a vet, knowing the signs of when to intervene and when not to, sneaking around to look at the, cat, the, the cows, you know, rather than upsetting them further. That's all really great information um, among all the other things that you shared. So I really appreciate you um, sharing that with our viewers because I think it's going to enlighten a lot of folks when it comes to breeding cows. Well, thank you for having me. It's, you know, it's really great. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And so to all of our viewers, um, thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Homesteading Academy. And again, Glenn's information will be in the description box and it is pinned to the chat. So um, stay tuned for more episodes of the Homesteading Academy. Take care, everybody.